Hello, everybody. Uh, I will start my presentation about forest ecosystem restoration success factors, and I will highlight the role of animals in seed dispersal. And this will be inferred from DNA metabarcoding. Um, so just a few, uh, a few ideas about ecological restoration. As you know, it's a process of assisting a recovery of an ecosystem that had degraded, damaged, or destroyed. And it aimed to recreate, initiate, or accelerate the recovery of a given ecosystem that was dis disturbed mainly by human causes. So as you know, ecosystem restoration is today very, uh, very trendy, if we can say this, because a lot of program are uh, putting it in, uh, in the frame of uh, any conservation initiative. Uh, so we can find it here in the, as a uh, social development goal by the UN as under the number 15. So for ecological restoration, we have to, uh, to be aware, first of all, about how ecological process uh, begin, starting from a barren habitat where we have pioneer species coming, then they will be followed by a communi community be be becoming more and more complex with time. So whenever we destroy an ecosystem or we disturb it, uh, we will go back in steps like in, in the game of, uh, of snakes and uh, ladders. So we go back and we have to go again and you will never go in the same direction. So, um, and furthermore, uh, when we have uh, when we count on passive recovery of an ecosystem, it may take uh, really a lot of time, sometimes hundreds of years, and sometimes never. So our role is to, uh, to work in this, um, uh, in this step. For example, if we have uh, a fire, after a fire, the question is, shall we uh, intervene? Shall we do something or, or keep it for a spontaneous regeneration? Uh, it's in fact depends from the severity of the fire. So seeds or root along with other plants and tree parts can remain in, uh, uh, inside and on the soil. So here we can count on uh, natural re regeneration. So we don't have really a lot of things to do in this case, unless the fire is really very severe and we have to do some engineering at the site to, uh, to boost uh, this regeneration. In fact, biological communities evolve over time. And uh, if we keep it doing alone, they will be covered again and again with a complex and more complex ecosystem. But as I said before, it may take hundreds of years. So I will give an example. So from now until the end of my presentation, I will be working on, um, uh, on an example of what we do uh, at St. Joseph University. But I have also uh, the unique opportunity uh, to apply what we, um, uh, what we learn in the lab and what we discover in the lab directly in the field with an uh, association, NGO, Jezur Lubnan, uh, which means Roots of Lebanon. So we try to apply all our uh, uh, ecosystem restoration science on the ground and then see what are the difficulties and come back to the lab and try to, to find uh, solutions. So here you have in, in front of you uh, a site where we have at, uh, uh, at your left, so this side, uh, a grazed area. So it's a degraded ecosystem. Uh, it's supposed to be a forest, but due to, uh, uh, to historical deforestation, then coupled with grazing, and after tens of years, this is the case today. So we fenced an area of, of more than 500 um, um, square meter, and after 12 years, as you can see, it doesn't evolve a lot. So we cannot see uh, trees, we cannot see complex ecosystems. So in this kind of places, ecosystem restoration and reforestation here uh, can be applied. So what we are doing here is, uh, we are doing kind of assisted natural regeneration. Uh, it refers to the intervention. We want to speed up the natural regeneration process, including measures for encouraging seed dispersal, soil restoration, clearing competing vegetation, and managing pests. So we are trying to do all of this and um, based on some uh, scientific background. So we are just helping and then we will, we will not, uh, it's, not, it's not supposed to be a formally managed 
um, managed project. We are trying to, to help it and then we'll step aside and see what will be happening. What we should uh, keep in mind that we just don't have to deal with biotic factors, with, with the plants to introduce, but also with abiotic factors because some, uh, for some species we have to, uh, to work on soil quality and see how much is it deteriorated before uh, doing this intervention. So, um, uh, I will be applying for the, some um, following slides uh, this concept about, uh, about restoration. So I'll begin with the dis disturbance of the site and how to choose our reference site. Uh, as I showed you a few slides before, we have here our site which is disturbed by historical deforestation and continuous grazing for, for hundreds of years. So uh, we have a lot of places like this in Lebanon and we are suffering from soil erosion and, uh, um, and we have to do something for these places. So here we have like this kind of this uh, um, paysage in, uh, in the summer where we have uh, hundreds of goats and sheep uh, roaming in this area and eating every single green, uh, green plant. So in this kind, we tried to do some, uh, some soil uh, study and we saw how much it's Im impoverished. And um, so we have to, to deal with this, uh, uh, with the soil improvement before uh, beginning our project. Um, if we can follow on this, uh, on this slide, here we have with this um, with this line, we see that already ecosystems are not stable. They can uh, fluctuate during time. But at some point here, when the disturbance began, we have uh, the ecosystem functioning, which is really dropped. And when disturbance ceased, we can begin, if we can see that we can just uh, wait for passive restoration or do something to, to recover the site. Uh, we have very few examples where sites were fully recovered, but we can do as much as possible to be close to, uh, to the original site. In fact, whenever we have to do a restoration, we have to choose uh, um, what we call a reference site. So this is how it should look if it wasn't disturbed. It's very difficult to have the previous unless we have uh, a place where it was really recorded how it was before. Otherwise, we have to choose what we call a reference site that serves as a model for restoring another one. So this one should be intact and uh, should have, we try to, to, to copy the functionality and uh, how it's structured. Taken into account that the age of the ecosystem will also be, uh, uh, be important. So for our site, for example, we have chosen a nature reserve where we have really complex biodiversity and uh, very nice uh, ecosystem functioning. So this will be our reference site. And um, we began so listing what are the species that pre are present in this uh, nature reserve and try to see which one are the keystone species that we will introduce in the beginning as pioneers, so they should uh, help us uh, recover. And this photo, you can see it, for example, in 2008 and then in 2018, and we can see that uh, we planted these cedar trees and very few other trees, but we can see that the vegetation cover already was enhanced by a uh, number of species, of species coming uh, spontaneously on, uh, on the site. While as, uh, another site, Few uh, few hundred of meter above, uh, we have also this um, the, our plantation with the vegetation cover, but it's slower than at lower uh, lower altitude. So first of all, uh, we have to deal other than the reference site about some uh, uh, genetics features in um, for the site. So we have to choose local genetic resources. Uh, because more likely they will be adapted for the target site, for the target ecosystem, but also because uh, they should be, um, we should avoid to, to introduce more complex factors by adding species that were not present before, maybe they're pollinators or uh, uh, they will not perform well or they may be invasive in, in some cases. So we have to choose our local, uh, local sources for, uh, for this project restoration. And um, 
we will not forget about using uh, some also to, to monitor the animals in, uh, in this, uh, this site. So we will collect it from nearby sites if they are uh, present and this will increase the chances of successful establishment of our ecosystem. So wherever possible, uh, we will use genetic material native to the protected area or to this area or from adjacent one. And uh, at this level, we have uh, to, examine, uh, to examine some uh, uh, some features about uh, our plants and understand what we should uh, what we should use and at what genetic diversity uh, should we uh, take into account. So we have a conifer species, of course, and we have many deciduous species that are present. Just for uh, um, for info, in this nature reserve, we have thirty nine different species of tree. We have like uh, eight different conifer species. And we have all the other are uh, deciduous trees, are angiosperm. So here we have, we can refer to uh, this excellent work that still, even if it was published, uh, published a few years ago, it's still really very, um, uh, very important and it, uh, it details all what we need as information. So uh, during the last years, we had, uh, we, we gathered a lot of info about our our conifers and their genetics. We have, for example, here a study on, on Cedrus libani compared to other cedar species in the Mediterranean. And we have very uh, fine scale study about the population in Lebanon. And we can see that some of them had a very slow, a very low genetic diversity. Some of them are, uh, are encountering some, uh, uh, some genetic drift. So we avoid using the genetic material from this population and to more uh, focus on, on other population of Cedrus Tibani. We also did some uh, interesting study on Junipers Excelta, uh, studying their genetic diversity and genetic differentiation in Lebanon, but also in the region. And here we discovered, for example, a, a, a cryptic population, a cryptic species, where we have a, a Junipers polycarpus that we didn't know before that it was present in Lebanon. And we discovered genetically and compared it to, uh, to the original one present in uh, Kurdistan and discovered that it's also present in Lebanon. So uh, we have also some uh, information about uh, species migration during this uh, climate, uh, climate change and uh, we are taking also into account in our uh, while choosing our material about um, the rear edge population and the front edge population, how they are moving and uh, if the genetic material is appropriate to do some uh, to do this work. So we have this kind of, uh, of genetic background and uh, it's not always possible to do it like we do uh, on papers, but still it's important because it's better than uh, we just advance while uh, our eyes are closed. So whenever we can, we can use this, uh, uh, this uh, bunch of information, genetic information that we have in the lab, we are using it uh, on the ground. Um, I will just uh, put a few slides interesting while uh, explaining that we cannot apply uh, very, uh, in a very simple way uh, the same principle for all the species, even, even though they, they, uh, they lived through the same uh, problem, environmental problem, I'm talking about, um, about age, uh, glacial age and last glacial maximum and then now with the global warming. So all these species, our plant species are experiencing the same thing, but each one will live it in its own way depending on its biology. So for example, uh, for our conifer species, I'll talk here about uh, abies and cedrus. We know that in, in abies, for example, we have the female uh, cones that are really on the top of the tree while the male are uh, below uh, the needles. So for pollination, if we want to avoid, uh, this is uh, this to avoid self-pollination, so it's very difficult for the pollen to go from down to up to pollinate the same tree. While for cedars, uh, male and uh, female cone are distributed everywhere, but to avoid self-pollination, they have a genetic uh, ability to recognize their own pollen and stop uh, and stop 
uh, the fecundation. So this is, for example, something that differs between ABS and cedars, and it will play a major role on their genetic diversity makeup. Also for pollen size and, uh, and shape, and how it will travel with, with wind or insect. In all these cases, it's uh, wind pollinated. We have also some interesting features about a seed dispersal mode of all these three. Some of them are dispersed by birds, others are dispersed by wind or by uh, other animals. So just to go back uh, to our, uh, our trees, these are four conifer species. We have Abia silicica, Cedrus libani, Junipers drupacea, and Junipers excelsa. They are on a, on a real scale. So here, uh, you can just by, by seeing this uh, photo, imagine how, uh, how the seed dispersal will differ from one species to another. In fact, even though the abias and cedrus are, um, are dispersed by wind, the weight and the shape of uh, the seed is not the same. So we can see that uh, abia silicica is a heavy seed and with a shorter wing. So when dispersed by, by wind, cedar will go farther. And the case of juniper is that here we, are, we have dispersion, dispersion by animals. And junipers excelsa having small berries have, can be also dispersed by birds, which is not the case of junipers drupacea. And this, for example, can explain the, uh, the geography distribution of these species today, how they recolonized after uh, the glacial age. And you see that the one dispersed by birds dispersed farther from uh, different refuge area present at that, uh, at that time. So all of this information are linked to what we are doing today and we try to take it into consideration while choosing our uh, genetic material. While about succession, uh, so here we have to help the plant, the foundation plant to, uh, uh, to create the shade and uh, the moisture uh, before introducing the, um, uh, the other trees. When you, for example, for, for our cedar tree, we are trying to cover them for the first two or three years, and then they will be uh, harsh enough to, uh, to go alone. And after being like, like one or two meter tall, we will have another species that can grow in their shade. Sometimes we, we use facilitation we, when soil, because here, when we don't have anything, the soil is uh, somehow uh, poor. So we can try to plant them beside uh, some thorny species and here the soil is much richer. And finally, we'll talk about community assembly and which is a nice, uh, an interesting part in my, in my talk. So we try to take into consideration that the forests are not just trees and it's not by doing reforestation and planting trees, it's not just this, uh, the ecosystem restoration. We have a much complex approach and we have to take into consideration what already present on the site, the soil microbiota and the animal component. And here we can see, for example, uh, the role of thorny species, I just talked about them, who are making the soil uh, richer and that can uh, help plant to grow and have some shade during uh, the cold time, but also during the, the summer where UV and, uh, uh, and uh, evaporation are very important. Then the soil biodiversity, we are conducting some analysis of the soil to see, uh, uh, to study some parameters and especially to study the mycorrhiza, especially for conifers uh, when we know that they are associated to mycorrhiza that made um, their life really, really nice and they can be more resilient and uh, less prone to, uh, to dehydration. So this one and the major component I will uh, focus in on is uh, about animal component. And it's something new. It's the first time in our region that we tackle this, uh, this problem. And we wanted to know which animal disperse which plant. Uh, the animals we have in Lebanon are uh, already, we don't know if they are still exist. Uh, following the, bio, the literature, we find that we have like 18 different mammal species, a small size. We are not uh, studying all the animals. It will come with time. We will study later on the bird's effect on plants, bird dispersal. But now we are working on, uh, on, on mammals. And this one, not, uh, not uh, the bats. So we wanted to study this. And uh, we have classical way to see if they are present or not. 
but we wanted to have something a uh, little bit faster and, and accurate because we didn't found all the species lately. So what we did is uh, we wanted to apply uh, the metabarcoding technique on the scats, on the poops that uh, animals leave on, on the ground. And here we, uh, we are doing this since like five years now and we are um, uh, at the end and we are near having very interesting results. So we have to collect scats on site. It depends uh, how we will conserve them, uh, if it, they were collected in winter or in summer. We isolate DNA in a special technique because it's environmental DNA it, and it's somehow uh, degraded. And then we will apply our, uh, we use primer to target some sequences inside. And we will do this uh, high throughput sequencing or next generation sequencing to, uh, to have what we have in our uh, scat. So we will have, in fact, the animals that do that poop it and all wh what he ate. And uh, all these sequences that we, they will be um, uh, given by, by the machine have to be compared to a reference library to see which sequence correspond to which animal or to which plant. And we had here a major limitation. So before going further, we had to construct our own reference library. For the plant, it wasn't very difficult. We had to go to this nature reserve and to co collect plants. And we did, for example, the DNA barcoding for all the plants. So now when we will have a sequence for Malus trilobata appearing in the poop, it will blast with it in, in the reference library. While for animals, it was a little bit difficult because we don't have, um, we, we, it's not, the animals are not very keen to collaborate when we call them. So we had to find a way to, um, uh, to, to reach their DNA. Uh, unfortunately, we had to collect some uh, roadkill animals, but these one were like three or four species. We found them like this. Otherwise, we managed to go to uh, a private collection, uh, a private museum. Uh, they had material from like 54 years ago. And uh, we collected this material from uh, mainly from the pads of, uh, of these animals. So this is where DNA was in the best, um, uh, best state. Don't forget that these um, skin animals were treated chemically to be uh, able to, to be conserved until now. And then, so we, for the plant, we use these markers, the RBCL and TRNL. For plants, for animals, excuse me, we use 12S uh, barcode. And uh, we constructed our reference library and the results are to be uh, to appear soon in, in genome. So uh, all our data also joins the database of Barcode of Life, uh, of which we are today uh, part. So what's uh, striking in our results, I will not give all the results, it's my PhD student, she will talk about them uh, very soon. Uh, just to, to tell you how um, they change our way of thinking and something very practical. For example, for, uh, for these uh, foxes, we usually know that they are carnivore and they eat some fruit. But we, uh, we were happy to see that because our study we did it, we collected the poops all the year long, all year long. So we, we discovered that in winter, they mainly rely on Rosa canina. Uh, seeds or rosa seeds. These are the only uh, source of um, uh, of uh, of food during winter. And now, uh, for example, we try during our um, work to to plant this kind of uh, of shrubs or trees when they can go. We are not just planting cedar and uh, the other fruit tree. So it's something that can be limiting when uh, for the corridors when these animals will move. So these are, uh, for, we did it already for, uh, for like uh, 15 species. These are the three ones that were best studied. And we discovered that in fact, even our carnivores, we call them carnivores, are found to be major group of frugivores and seed dispersers. And um, so this animal community, without talking now about animals, about birds, uh, play a major role on ecosystem uh, uh, durability. So we are planting the trees now, but these animals are responsible from spreading sp seeds in order to have um, a, a natural regeneration later on in, in, South, in on tens of years. So, uh, and then after 10 years of doing it, or of doing this, we, we are trying to see what are the success factors and what are the um, 
um, the points that are important for our plants. And uh, we applied lately what we call uh, the recovery wheel by uh, IUCN Ecological Restoration for Protected Area. And this recovery wheel can tell us how we are evolving during this time, how our ecosystem is performing with time and uh, it's different of course between one site and another. So I finished, I took a few minutes uh, more. I would like to thank all the people who, uh, uh, who were uh, solidar with, uh, with us after this uh, blast in Beirut. And I will just want to reassure you that we are, thanks God we are alive, the students are good and we continue planting. Thank you, sometimes with very prestigious personalities. Thank you, and I'm ready for questions. <laughs>